Welcome to our online service this week. You may have seen us around on a few of the Fuse Youth videos, but for those of you who don't know us, I'm Sarah and this is Zach, and we're part of the youth and young adults community at Berwick Church of Christ. That's right, and we have the privilege of being your hosts today. Now we're going to hear from Pastor Bram and one of our elders, Bron Cameron, as we explore the vision of Berwick Church of Christ. Thank you, young adults. It's wonderful to have you guys as hosts. And it's wonderful for me today to welcome Bronwyn Cameron, one of the leaders of our church, on our online experience. And she's going to share a few things with us. Bronwyn, why don't we start by you introducing yourself and tell us a bit about the role that you play in the church. Hi, Bram. Yeah, great to see you today. Um, my name is Bronwyn and I am on the Board of Elders in the church. I've been on for about two terms now. I'm in my third term. Um, I also host a life group of about um, 20 who join us regularly on Zoom. That's good. And Bern, we had hopes this past weekend with Father's Day that we would have an extra special Father's Day gift in the terms of restrictions being lifted. That hasn't been the case. And obviously, you as part of the leadership of the church help us steer towards the future. What's your counsel in, in perspective of this roadmap that we've been given? Yeah, thanks, Bram. It, it was a little bit slower than we all would have liked. And I think we've all had to catch our breath and take a deep breath. Um, I think the longer we go into this, um, I'm just realising what a, a complex situation it is and how difficult it is. It is, and I'm just really aware and conscious of praying for um, those who are in authority making decisions, those who are in our, our state leadership and federal leadership, and just so important to be praying for them as they help us through this COVID crisis. Um, beyond that, um, I think my counsel would be to just continue to stand, stand really strong in the Lord. I've tried to, in my own life, very much pay attention to spending my hour a day with the Lord like I usually did. Um, I've had to think about uh, different ways uh, to worship since we've had our usual avenue for worship stripped away. I've had to think about um, more what I get to read and listen to. And I've also tried to um, take my family on that journey as well. And um, so we make it a regular thing to sit down on a Sunday morning and continue to watch the service. Um, I think I'm also just trying to be really mindful of our mission to be his presence in every place and to do what I can in this season, in these moments. Now that might be a really restricted environment but for me it looks like my family and my life group um, there are some neighbors I get to have contact with and also in our business in concreting uh, we have some staff so I get to contact with them as well so it's just looking to the Lord and saying am I um, doing what he's requiring of me in terms of loving people and serving people and doing what I can in um, my community, even though it is quite restricted now. Thanks, Bonner. That's good. Many people ask the question, how can they support the church in this season? How can they support BCOC? Because the normal avenues of support seems to have narrowed down. What would your counsel be for those? Oh, look, we are just so blessed in this church and I'm so proud of the online material that our teams are producing. They're just doing an amazing job our, with our services, the, the extra stories that are being um, posted, the worship, the kids' church, the views, the young adult. Um, so I'd like to tell people to um, watch those and tap into them and use those resources. Um, but actually, having said that, I think I'm the one who's being supported when I look at those things. They're just such an incredible support to all the members of our family. Um, things like uh, when we were offered postcards to drop to our neighbours and um, to our friends, I, I took that opportunity and I dropped them around our street and also on a different occasion to my coffee shop where I am still able to visit 
um, a few times a week. Um, so I would encourage people to really tap into what's on offer at the church. Um, I think that's a real support to our staff. Um, we're very grateful that our business um, has been able to continue and that we've been blessed. And uh, so we've been able to continue to give to our local church. And I would encourage others to do that. It, it might perhaps seem that um, staff have less to do or can't do what they used to do, but having been part of the board, nothing could be further from the truth. Our staff have actually been thrown into a whirlwind of activity and they've had to recast themselves, adjust, be flexible, learn new skills. They are absolutely working harder than they've ever worked before. So um, they really are doing an amazing job. And just on that note, I'd also like to encourage you, if you get a moment to encourage the staff, if you are able to text them or send the church an email, um, it would be a huge encouragement to them. Because like most people, they're working a bit in isolation at the moment. So that's what I would encourage people to, to do for our church at the moment. Yeah, that's good counsel, Bronwyn. What's great about an online experience on every platform from kids right through to our services online is we see a consistent growth in the amount of people that follow it. So we do see that God is uh, taking us into new spaces. We do see growth in those areas. So thank you so much for your support as the board as well. Uh, we truly are learning a lot of stuff, but we can do that with all the support that we do get. So appreciate that so much. Why don't we end this interview with you praying for the church? Absolutely. Thank you. That'd be a real privilege. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the many blessings we have in this church. We thank you for our staff and for our pastors and for our volunteers who continue to work so hard behind the scenes to produce online experiences and connect with people, um, to pastorally care for them when needed as well, Lord. So I just thank you and ask that you continue to guide us and you continue to show us what our um, place is in this time, how to continue to be his presence in every place, even though we're operating in a totally different way at the moment, Father. We just thank you again for everything that we have. And um, I just pray for each individual, each person in our congregation, that you will also encourage them that you will guide them, that you will bless them, and that at the end of this, we will all come out stronger, both individually and corporately. We thank you in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the service, Bronwyn, with us, and let's join our young adults again. Cheers. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. It's great to hear from our church leaders on the vision. Now we're going to be launching into a new series called Forever Family, and Pastor Brown's going to be speaking on identity. And if you need prayer for any reason, please go to the link in the description. It'll be available from 6.15 Saturday or 10.45 Sunday. Now we're going to watch a few videos on the four M's of mission. My name is Philip and this is my wife, Pearl. Yeah, we migrated to Australia about 14 years ago. Uh, we did it because uh, for our children's education. And I was at a career crossroad where I have to decide whether to remain in Malaysia or to migrate to Australia. After uh, prayer and uh, we thought about it, uh, we came to the decision that our whole family should migrate to Australia. Now, it was not easy uh, to migrate to another country. Uh, we had to make a lot of adjustments. For me, the biggest uh, challenge uh, was to find a suitable job. Uh, even as a New Zealand Chartered Accountant, uh, it took me quite some time to get a suitable job I wanted. Uh, I ended up uh, working in a big four bank. Now, as a new migrant, uh, there are certainly uh, many challenges to overcome and uh, many adjustments to be made. Uh, joining a church 
uh, and uh, being involved in a small group fellowship has helped tremendously. Uh, as a result uh, of our experience, uh, uh, we felt very strongly that we should uh, be reaching out to new migrants. Now, when we joined uh, Mary Church of Christ, uh, we about three years ago, uh, we find that the church uh, was very welcoming, uh, very helpful and very warm. And uh, we want to thank the church also that you know, they are very supportive of us uh, being involved, uh, doing the small group fellowship to help the migrant. Yeah. I shared Philip's sentiment that it's just so important to get connected to a local community. As for me and my family, being a part of the church community has created a sense of belonging, which is so critical and s s crucial in uh, helping us to settle into this new country, into this new environment. I remember 14 years ago when we just arrived in uh, Australia, just like what uh, Philip had experienced, I was confronted with the reality that I couldn't find a suitable job despite my many years of teaching experience. Just because I didn't have a local experience or a local qualification. It took me three and a half years to come to terms with the reality and resign to the fact that going back to uni and to get a local qualification was the only pathway for me to move on with my career. And today, I'm happy to say that I'm doing my dream job. Grace be to God. Hi, I'm Sue Nichols and I, um, I'm involved in res and responsible for the playgroup ministry here at the church and just wanted to tell you a little bit, been asked to tell you a little bit about what we, what we get up to in playgroup ministry. So normally if it wasn't restrictions and we were able to operate playgroup at the moment, we would, this place would be buzzing with little kids and their mums. Uh, you might get run over by a little ride on car like that one and you'd certainly have to watch out for these swings because they'd be going constantly. Um, so it's a, bit, it's a very busy little place. So we've been running playgroup here at the church for well over 20 years and in that time we've developed a fabulous reputation in the community. So most of our families are actually from the local area, from the community. And we actually run a really, really simple program and our, our main focus is on relationships between the kids and the, the parents. So just a simple program gives us time to get to know people and develop those relationships, so that's really important. The other thing that we're able to do is let the families know about things at the church that might interest them, so whether that's uh, church services themselves, of course, but also parenting courses, alpha, woman to woman, that type of thing, anything that the families might benefit from. Our greatest joy in playgroup, though, is to see families actually get connected in, connected to Christ and connected to his church. So that's really our ultimate goal in why we run playgroups. Obviously, we're looking forward to being able to run playgroups again. We're not really sure when that might happen. Um, you might have heard that we have waiting lists for playgroup, and that's, that's true up to a point. However, we actually could run lots more groups and completely eliminate our waiting list. Uh, we just need more Christian families families and also some, some helpers to run that simple program that I was talking about. Um, so if, if Playgroup is something that you might be interested in joining or helping in, uh, it's certainly a, a fun, vibrant, exciting ministry to be part of. So I'd really love to chat to you anytime. Thank you. Hi, my name is Love and this is my husband, Dean. We have been married for 26 years. We don't have much in common, but at the beginning of our marriage, we made an agreement to join a Christian community. Through the years, it has molded our relationship. It has also changed how our mindset and how we interact with each other. Like in 1 Corinthians 12, we all have equally important roles with Christ being the head of our family. I do the cooking, one love does the cleaning. 
my work around the house are mostly outside while hers are inside and with with working on our finance uh, i normally do the balancing of the books while love does the auditing we also love traveling we enjoyed our adventures while we were still living in new zealand we love uh, we've done road trips on long weekends and we've covered most of the country we've learned to enjoy each other's company we both love coffees and we like watching movies and on a sunny um, weekends we love to ride our bicycles and on special occasions we like to eat out and now that we're in melbourne we'd like to see more new places whatever we do we make sure that we involve god and ask him to precede each one in making decisions when one of us disagrees then both of us will have to let it go if things doesn't go our way like the watchman that waits for the morning on Psalm 130 we expect breakthrough from his word to bring us hope we love being at home too on a sunny afternoon we take a walk around our area it is the best time because we have each other's full attention this lockdown <clears throat> has it's the best time to be still we get to ask each other what happened throughout our day we get to know more about what our likes and our dislikes and then we compromise god has truly been with us through our journey as the lord declares on jeremiah 29 11 he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you he has plans to give you hope and a future thank you One of the truest things that has ever been said about forgiveness is I can forgive, but I can't forget. That is true. That's true because in your head you've got the latest state-of-the-art Apple Macintosh computer and it remembers everything that ever happens. Oh, well, sometimes it forgets to buy the milk on the way home from work but it remembers. And all you need to do is to push the right recall button and painful memories will come back and good memories will come back too. Many people say to me, I think I've forgiven, but I still remember. And the memories themselves have a painful effect on my life. That was demonstrated to me very powerfully as I flew home from America after the counselling that I received and, and I was rejoicing in the forgiveness that, that I had been able to offer to the abuser and the forgiveness that had set me free and rejoicing in God's forgiveness and all those things, just very exciting stuff. And then suddenly I remembered that back home in, in Melbourne, whenever I went out in my car, I would see big yellow transport trucks. They were very common, this particular company, and they had blazed across the front of the truck the name of the person who abused me. Just happened to be the same name. And every time I saw it, I could even be going to preach somewhere or coming home from preaching somewhere, and I would, I would see this name and all this anger, almost bile, would rise up inside me and I would feel this hostility and this bitterness and this shame and this anger. And I knew that when I got back to Melbourne, even after this wonderful experience, I would still see these trucks. And, and I began to tremble inside. It was like this, this panic that maybe I'm going to get home and the same thing will happen and then I will realize that I haven't really forgiven her after all. Well, I got home and it wasn't, I wasn't in Melbourne very long before I saw one of these big transport trucks and across the front was the name of my abuser. And I felt all the same pain that I'd ever felt before. But this time, it was like God spoke to me so clearly and he said graham these trucks have been like tombstones in your life and every time you've seen one 
It's reminded you of the, of the pain and the loss and the shame. But I want to change, I want to convert your tombstones into milestones. And I'm old enough to remember that when you used to drive along the highway, there'd be, there'd be little white rocks on the side of the road with a number on them and the number would tell you how far you'd come since you passed the last one. And that was what God was teaching me, that every time this memory came back, not to see it as a tombstone reminding me of the past, but a milestone showing me how far I've come since I learned to forgive. And I learned how whenever I saw this truck or whenever a memory came back was to say, thank you, God, that I live in the freedom of forgiveness. Don't ever be deceived into thinking because you can remember you haven't forgiven because God wants to turn that memory into a memorial of the healing, not a memorial of the hurt. Your pain may have been very deep, but the relief that comes when you're free of resentment is even greater. It's God's gift to us, God's love gift to us, to be free and to be free indeed. I want to just commend to you today this concept of, of receiving God's forgiveness and then passing that forgiveness on to the people who wound you and to the people around you who might even just simply upset you, but being able to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you is a wonderful thing indeed. God bless you as you apply these principles to your life. Thanks to everyone who was a part of these amazing videos. It's super exciting to see our church ministry grow and become his presence in every place. All right, are you ready? Yes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, come on, come on. Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Come on, shoot. Oh, was it in? Oh, well done, well done. Okay, guys, well done. So what we're going to do is I'm going to change the game. So come with me. Let's check this out. You know what this is? Let's change the game. Okay, you ready? All right, same game, different ball, go. Bounce it, bounce it, bounce it. Give me the ball. So this is what COVID has done to us. It has changed the game completely. You might think you're still playing at the same court, but the ball has changed. It changes everything. This is the way we as people sometimes experience life. We have similar surroundings, but something very, very unique has changed. And we need to adapt to that. So uh, I'd like to share some of my story, my life story as how change brought about something beautiful in how I perceive my own value and worth as an individual. So let's go to where this game should be played. We're going over there to the footy field. Let's get the ball there. So one of my first encounters with game-changing moments in my life was when I was in primary school back in South Africa. And some of you might recognize this ball. It's a rugby union ball and the country I grew up in was rugby union mad. And it was our dream as young boys always to play for our national team as, as rugby players. And I was in school playing rugby for my school. And uh, one day during break, we had a game on the, the sports field. And just shortly after break, I got a call from the headmaster to come to his office. He presented me with a letter, a letter that changed my life, a letter that really uh, altered the way that I saw reality because it invited me to a rugby camp 
and at that rugby camp I would be exposed to an all-black rugby player and I would have the privilege of being coached by some all-blacks which at that time was the gods of rugby. Now you've got to understand from a very secure well-known environment being taken as the only boy in my school into a foreign group of young boys, 120 of them to a rugby camp. I knew I was going to be on my own for a while and I had to establish my own sense of value and worth in that new environment. Not always that easy as a young boy. Uh, but if you understand rugby, you'll know what it's about. It's about turning yourself and your body into a flesh bomb when you can exert your opinion or your desire or your your yearning to break through the defense barriers of another team onto them so you use all of your power, all of your strength, everything you have within you. You muster all of that energy just to break into that team and try and break their defense line and break through. And if you can exert your will on them, you will have a break through the defense line and the possibility of scoring a try would be awesome. And that's the aim of the game. So I knew something is changing. I'll have to establish my own sense of identity between 120 young rugby players all wanting to play in front of an all-black rugby player. So part of the game is, is you make yourself a lot of enemies because you attack people with everything that you are physically and emotionally. And the aim is to get the, the ball to the other side of the try line, which would be where those posts would be in front of me. And uh, that's the aim. So you would hurt people all the way there. And that's the way you get uh, ahead in a combat sport like rugby. The problem is at night at this camp, we had to become friends. So the, the very guys that you manhandled on the field became the guys that you had to make friends with post-game and post-match. And that, that, that required a whole different set of skills. And how do you establish your identity in a new environment? You oscillate usually between this the self-interest and the self-motivated uh, ability to enforce your will on others to the other side of the continuum where you try to please everybody. On this side it's I'll, I'll let you bow before what I want. On this side is I'll bow before what you want. And people oscillate between these two extremes these days, especially in a time like COVID, where they would want to establish who they are, what's their sense of worth, how do I engage in this, this complicated new season that I find myself in. And you, you, you become confused because who you were only were relevant in a certain reality. And as COVID has changed reality, I see so many people struggling with their own sense of self and their own sense of worth. And they either grasp towards self-interest and self-expression or trying to play the crowd. But there's a magnificent, magnificent way of how God can reposition us to have a deep sense of value and a deep sense of worth, even when the game has changed like it has for us in Victoria. So the world we live in today has so much similarity with the rugby world. Uh, you know, you get contact sports like dancing, but then you get collusion sports like rugby. Life is many times a collusion sport where you collide with realities you were never prepared for. You see, the aim is to enforce yourself on your circumstances and then you'll find a sense of worth and the sense of value and that's the credo of the self-help gurus but then there's also the socialites that say no matter what the world wants you just fit in with the stream and flow with it and be as popular as you can be and that'll give you a sense of value and a sense of worth but there's a problem with that Neither of those really satisfies and fulfills a human being. Uh, three basic problems. Firstly is that uh, your, your, own, your own goals which you try to achieve is sometimes incoherent. You would want to be a successful businessman, but at the same time you would love to be a family man and they clash with one another. It's difficult to manage that. Uh, you might want to be the best baker in the world but have a six-pack, ain't gonna work. So it's critical for you to understand that the incoherency that you find in trying to express yourself or trying to, to please everybody around you 
will tear you apart. Secondly, those things we strive for many times don't really satisfy. I am reminded regularly by people, especially in the sports field, that achieve the highest good in their field only to fall into depression straight afterwards because what they aim for doesn't really satisfy. And then the third problem with trying to, to enforce yourself on society or to please everyone on the other side is that it's, it's very tiring. It does, it does deplete your energy levels because you never get to that point where you have the deep sense of value and deep sense of worth. And therefore it's critical for you to ask yourself, what's my mechanism? to try and achieve the sense of value and the sense of worth. You see, most people will try to survive life by achieving some, some sense of value, some sense of worth. And they would work late nights, long hours, never go on holiday, sacrifice so much just to achieve a sense of identity. It's such a pity that so many people end up on their deathbed and then they realize they've played the wrong game. They try to, to be successful in this collision sport called life. And actually it's not about what you can achieve. It's about something completely else. But before we go further, I'd like to continue my story on the rugby camp. Okay, so the aim of the game is to turn yourself into a flesh bomb and then run into your opponents to get the ball behind the goal post so you could go and score a try. That's what we call it, but it actually amounts to five points. So you would take your body, stiffen it up by tensing your muscles, take the ball, put it under your arm, find objects that you can pulverize with your body weight and your experience, and then run straight at them and see if they can stop you. You guys ready? Uh, <laughs> All right, go, 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 go. <laughs> More or less like that. And then you have your opponent sitting like that, full of pain. It didn't went well for me that day as it did today. But what happened was, at the end of the third day of the camp, they chose the teams, two teams, 30 boys out of 120, and those 30 would play in front of the All Blacks. As you can glean, I didn't make the cut. But they chose me to be something like the water boy. The privilege of taking the boys water half time of the game. It's kind of a backhand in rugby terms. But what happens is you stand as the water boy next to the field and wait for the game to get past the halfway turn, the intake water to the guys. But with you would be the coaches. They let you onto the field to take the water. Half time came and it's gone. I was standing there with the coaches and the All Blacks were there as well. They were watching the game. And uh, then something happened. One of the guys on the field got injured and there was no reserves left. And one of the All Blacks put his hand on my shoulder and said to me, why don't you have a go? Me knowing there's 10 minutes left of the game and still having the world's energy, I ran onto that field. I played probably the best game I ever played in my life for 10 minutes. And then after the game, we all circled and we had the, the debrief of the game. And one of the All Black players said he'd like to announce who he would choose as a man of the match. And obviously I was sitting there. There were candidates that we all would presume would be the men of the, men of the match. But the next moment he blurted out my name. And suddenly I was the man. Suddenly I had this deep sense of value and rugby worth. Why? Because the praiseworthy All Black has praised me for my game. At that moment, Everything changed. The whole social structure changed. The way I responded to other people changed. The whole reality changed because I was, I was the one that was identified as the All Blacks' favorite. 
from that day on, I walked with a bit of an attitude on the field. Every game I played, whenever it went bad, I could tell myself, remember, that you were identified as a man of a match by an all-black player. That relates so well to this life. It relates so well in a life where people try to achieve. And in one moment, a word of praise from a praiseworthy authority figure changed the way I perceived myself, the way that my friends perceived me, and the way that I engage with my reality. And many Christians these days, they don't realize that that was part of what Jesus came to do. He came to vindicate your value and your worth as an individual. Let's see what the Word says about this. So there's a completely different source where you can find your sense of value and sense of worth. Apart from just achieving whatever society or yourself think you should be achieving. It reminds me of a story in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, where a young Jewish boy found himself amongst thousands of Jews yearning for some deeper sense of life and living. And they found themselves at the river being baptized by a prophet, probably the greatest prophet that ever lived. And as this young boy went to submit his life to something bigger, an absolute miracle happened. As he, as he was uh, by this prophet baptized, that means he was taken down into the water of the river and brought up again into uh, an adult kind of life. It was a, a, a ceremony where they would uh, give boys a rite of passage to adulthood. Uh, he, he baptized this little boy and as he brought him up out of the river, something happened. The heavens opened and apparently God spoke from the heavens and said this. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It might just seem like a loving phrase from a father unto his son. But it's actually a quote from a Hebrew uh, rite that was executed on young boys when they turned 12, where a young boy would be adopted as a formal mature son into his inheritance into the father's household. And we see how this father from heaven just, just reaches out and praises his own son and say, in this son, I am well pleased. And this young boy... He probably looked up and realized he just received praise from the only praiseworthy. And at that moment, it said that the Spirit of God came down upon him like a dove. And something of who God was, his own spirit, possessed this boy. He became a man. That word son is not the Greek word that relates to a toddler. It is the word that relates to a mature son, a son that is entrusted with an inheritance. And then in the book of Ephesians, later on in the Bible, Paul actually says that God has predestined us unto the adoption to sonship which means the very same experience that Jesus had, receiving the praise from the praiseworthy, actually lays a name upon our lives and identifies us as the sons and the daughters of God. And here's the miracle. You know, you, your identity isn't found in how you can express yourself or dominate circumstances as an individual. Neither is it found in how you can please the crowd. It is found in God's opinion over your life. And therefore, if the game changes, you're ready for it. Because God has made up His mind about you. He has predestined you. To the adoption unto sonship. He doesn't have second class sons and first class sons. He only has sons and daughters in his kingdom. 
And that settles your identity. And whenever life changes and, and the game changes in your life, your first port of call is running back into God's opinion over your life. And understanding that you and I are sons and daughters of God. And from that, we can address any challenge that comes our way. Now, the beauty of this is that this sonship is shared with a whole community. God is adopting a whole family. And in this family, we find our identity forever. That's why when we as Christians come together, we celebrate what God says about us. It is our forever family. It's that family that we will still have in eternity. It's that family that we can run to when we need confirmation on how God feels about us. It is that family that we stick close to when the game has changed and the collision sport has become tough. So I wanna, I wanna challenge you, don't, don't let the isolation of the restrictions in Victoria tell you you're something you're not. Because you're a daughter and a son of God. There's so many mechanisms these days. There's technology. There is so many software that we could use to keep the connections glow, going and growing with this family of ours. And as we join with our forever family on a regular basis, we can let God's opinion reign over our lives. And that'll bring forth fruit in our lives. So don't become isolated. Use technology. Connect with your forever family. But here's the other challenge. You will be living in a neighborhood like mine here. And there's people around you that's isolated. The collision sport of COVID is causing serious challenges. Now, why don't you reach out to them and invite them? And say, hey, I found a place where you don't have to achieve to be someone. You can just receive God's opinion over your life. And as you receive God's opinion over your life, join me in my forever faith family. And let's speak the opinion of God over each other's lives. And there in your neighborhood, you'll find people desperate to be able to absorb God's opinion over their lives. I wonder, do you know your neighbors? Do you know their names? Do you know their collisions in this season? Do you know what they have collided with and that they're what they're struggling with? Maybe it's worth an email, a phone call, a video call, maybe a letter in the letterbox, just saying, hey, it's tough during this COVID collisions. But I'd like to let you know there's someone next door that would love to help you receive a favorable opinion of your sense of value and your sense of worth. Let's do that to our neighbors and let's not stop gathering together online in all the various ways that's possible and keep on speaking God's opinion over our lives. Let's do that. So I sit here on my veranda. The barbie is busy cooking the meat. And I'm hearing my neighbors as they speak and as they interact. And I'm praying for them while I'm preparing the meat for the family. And uh, as I was thinking about you, I thought it will be just great to pronounce over you and over my neighbors. God's intention for us. So firstly, I'd like to speak over your life that God will complete the work that He started within you. He's not going to keep you hanging. Secondly, God is unto you through Christ wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and power. After that, you've got to understand that God is your shepherd. You shall not want. He will lead you to pastures of green. Uh, you do not have to fret or be anxious. You do not have to be afraid because the Lord your God is with you. You are the body of Christ. The fullness of Him dwells within us. 
and we can be his presence in every place you have the mind of christ you hold the thoughts the feelings the intents of god in your being you are a believer you're not a doubter uh, hold on to your confession of faith you're one of those who walk by faith and not by sight by his stripes you were healed you have been given the ministry of reconciliation and there's no relationship that cannot be restored because of the power of the blood of Jesus you tread upon serpents and scorpions you have victory over the one who walks around seeking those whom he can devour you are victorious over him your mind is enlightened by you the knowledge and the revelation of God's calling and purpose for your life you fear not because God has given you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind may you take these truths about who you are your identity in Christ may you take them with you absorb them in your soul and for the next few moments as you listen to these two songs that will be following at the end of the service why don't you just sit back and relax and absorb God's opinion over your life and, and draw the truth into your spirit and say, God, thank you. Thank you that I can live with the truth, forming and renewing my mind, transforming even old stinking thinking into an enlightened mind, filled and flooded with a revelation of who I am in Christ. Know this, the pastors, the elders, our families, we consistently pray for you. And our prayer is that you will enjoy being part of God's forever family. God bless you.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Oh, Jesus. 
Thanks for a great message, Pastor Brown. I'm really encouraged and I'm sure many of you guys are too. We're super excited for part two next week. and We hope to see you guys join in. We'd also really love to connect with you all. And one of the ways we can do that is if you like or subscribe to this video. All the details for our socials will be on the screen as well. We'll see you all next week.